charge a standard Sony NP730 battery. First plug the charger unit into the wall, and then slide the battery into the charger, and the little charge light plugging it into the charging unit. Often it actually goes up in this corner right here. And then we can insert another battery into the camcorder itself. So in this arrangement, we actually recharge the battery that's in the camcorder as well as the battery that's in the charger. Now the way I just plugged this in is the exact same way you would plug in the camcorder to run it directly off the house current at the same time. You have to do one or the other. Now it takes about three hours to charge a standard NP730 battery, which will run the VX1000 for anywhere from 40 to 80 minutes and the VX700 for anywhere from 55 to 110 minutes. When you remove the tiny green flag on the back that indicates that the camcorder now batteries that have been charged in the camcorder, this green flag will not appear and you'll have to set it manually by just pushing it up like that. You don't need to worry about memory effect with these batteries, so you don't need to completely discharge them before you recharge them. You can recharge them whenever you want. You go out on shoot because stored batteries will lose their charge after a while. And also be careful of the temperatures that you charge them at because you don't want to charge them at temperatures above 86 degrees Fahrenheit and 30 degrees Celsius or below 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, but Sony does make a DC power supply which allows you to recharge these batteries by simply plugging DC to AC converters such as this one purchased from Radio Shack. This unit also plugs into the cigarette ladder in your car. And then you can plug any AC accessory including your Sony battery charger into it. It works well, and it will also turn off if the charging and battery gets too low. If you're going to need to run your camcorder off of the battery for an extended period of time, then you may want to consider purchasing some external batteries to test score. This unit will power the camcorder for about three or four hours, and it costs about the same as the Sony NP730 battery. Now over here I have an NRG battery belt. And this unit will actually power the camcorder for as little as five hours or as much as eight hours, depending on whether you're zooming a lot or using the auto functions. The problem with external batteries and the NRG battery belt is that they're heavy and they're bulky and they've got wires hanging off all over them. This little standard battery works really well because it's fairly light and it just fits right in there. And in most situations, all you need to do is charge up three or four before you go out, go out on your shoot and you're ready to go. Here we go. You have your viewfinder set up. Perhaps you've mounted a view monitor on the camcorder. You have plenty of power, either AC or a battery. You have a tape loaded in the camcorder. So now what? Before you begin shooting, it's very important to understand the operation of the power switch the hold auto lock switch, the standby switch, and around here on the barrel, the focus switch. Now the power switch has two positions. Down here at the bottom has the VTR position, and this actually turns on this little control panel where you can play a tape. But to shoot, you actually want to push this button in and rotate it into the camera position. Now the camcorder may not turn on when you do this, and that's because the standby switch needs to be rotated down from the lock position in up. Now, in between shots, when you're not doing anything, you want to rotate this back up into the lock position, and the camcorder will shut down now, and all these settings on the back will be locked up so you can't change them. And then when you're ready to shoot, you just rotate this back into the standby position. With the tape loaded, if you don't use the camcorder for five minutes, the camera will automatically power back down. The reason it shuts down is to stop the video heads from spinning against the tape and eventually wearing the tape out. In order to restart the camcorder, You'll need to move the standby switch up into the lock position and then back down into the standby position and the camcorder will power up again. Now down here at the bottom of the standby switch is the photo position and this is for taking seven second still images. Now the third very important switch here is the hold auto lock switch. And this has three positions. The bottom position is the auto lock position where the camcorder will set everything automatically. In the middle position is the manual position, and here you can set everything manually, including your exposure, shutter speed, white balance, and on the VX1000, the audio level. And once set, you can move this into the hold position, and this will hold those manual settings so that they can't be changed. For now, we'll place this in the auto lock position, or the automatic position. And then around on the side, we have the auto focus switch, 
and this has three positions. It is adjusted automatically by the camcorder. The manual position, where you can adjust the focus using the focus ring here, and the infinity position down here at the bottom, which focuses the camcorder for distant objects. And we're going to set this in the auto focus position for now. To begin recording, you press the red button in the middle of the standby switch, and you'll hear a beep, and the tally light will go on. Now the tally light is there on the front and the rear of the camcorder to tell your talent that you're recording. Come around to the back and open the rear door. Now up here at the top we have the menu button, which we push to turn on the menu display. And then we can move up and down through the menu through the, these down arrows and up arrows. And we'll move down to the beep item and then hit the execute button down here at the bottom. And you can see we have two positions, the on off positions here in the beep item. And we'll just hit execute to go back. And then we can move up one to the headphone settings and then hit execute. And we have three settings here, the low, the mid, and the high. And then we'll hit execute to leave that. And then go down two to the EVF mode. This is the electronic viewfinder mode. And hit the execute button to open up that. And we can move down and set the color level and the brightness level for the viewfinder in this item. And we'll just hit execute to leave that. And then we'll hit the menu button to leave the menu display. To monitor your audio while you're recording, you need a good pair of cupped headphones. Cupped headphones are ideal because they isolate your ears from the surrounding area so you hear exactly what the camcorder is hearing. And they plug into the side right underneath this little rubber piece here. Now to set your audio level, you have to look at the audio level meters on the back of the camcorder. And this is only on the VX1000, it's, you do not have a record level meter on the VX700. And you can see now that while we're recording that the timecode display is rolling right here. And when we stop recording by pressing the start stop button again, you hear the beep of the stopping, and you also can see that the timecode display has stopped rolling. To check your recording, come around here to the edit search button, and here you should press on the side, the minus side end, the one that has a little nub, once, and then the camcorder will rewind to play the last couple seconds of your last shot so you can see it in the viewfinder, and then set up for the next shot. And you should try to avoid removing the tape from the camcorder between your code. These numbers on the rear display, and you can also see these at the bottom of your viewfinder, are the timecode display. And it's simply a numbering system that is recorded onto the tape with your video. Whenever you place a blank tape into the camcorder and begin recording, the timecode begins counting up from zero. So this is hours, minutes, and seconds. And I'll just start continuing to record this. And you can see every time you start recording, it picks up and continues to number up on the tape. So by numbering each frame, your video editing system will be able to easily locate any shot by its time code location on the tape. If there may be a short gap between the end of the previous recorded shot and your next shot. If this happens, then the time code being recorded onto the tape will begin again from zero. Now the problem is that now you have two sections of video on this one tape with identical time code numbers, and this will make it impossible for your editing system to tell those two sections of tape apart. So to avoid this problem, every time you remove a tape from the camcorder and then reinsert it to continue shooting, you need to check and make sure that the new shot will slightly overlap the previous shot. By overlapping slightly, say four or five frames, the timecode numbering system will continue to number up from where the previous shot left off. When you're completely finished recording on a tape, you should open the record inhibit slide on the tape. That way you can no longer accidentally record on the tape. When you're ready to play a tape, first move the power switch into the VTR position, and VTR stands for Video Tape Recorder, and then your control panel lights up here, stop, rewind, play, fast forward, and pause, and then connect up your television set, you need to come around to the other side, to these connections here, and for the best picture, you should use an S-Video connector, which plugs in here at the top, and then for your audio, you should have two RCA audio cables, which plug into these two audio connections on the bottom, and then the other ends plug into your television set. Now, if your television set doesn't have an S-Video connector, then you can use a standard RCA. It gives a slightly lower quality picture, but it still works fine. Now, if your television set doesn't have even RCA connections, then you can use an RF adapter, which doesn't come with a camcorder. You'll have to buy one. It looks like this. It plugs into these connections like so. And then you can use a standard RF cable, which plugs into that, and that combines the video and the audio into a single signal, which will plug into just about any television you'll find in the entire world. 
And you can also use your remote commander, just like you would the normal remote control on your VCR at home. Here we go! One of the most important accessories you can buy for any camcorder is a good camcorder bag or case. They come in all shapes and sizes, including hard-sided bags for shipping and for airline travel, and large duffel bags for carrying a lot of extra equipment. And backpack bags like this one, which are good for hiking, walking, and general traveling with the camcorder. The bag you choose should be padded to protect the camcorder from shock, and it should also be able to seal up, to seal out the elements. Water will kill your camcorder faster than anything else. In a pinch, you can use a plastic bag to seal the camera up and protect it from wind and rain. Just place it into the plastic bag and we'll just put the uh, strap inside. And then you can use a uh, Velcro strap or even a rubber band to seal around the lens itself. And because the plastic bag is clear, you can still operate the controls of the camcorder. But if you're going to intentionally take your camcorder out in wet conditions, then you should buy either a commercial rain jacket for the camcorder or get a completely sealed underwater enclosure. It's not just rain or snow that can cause damage. Humid conditions can also cause water to condense inside your camcorder. In cold climates, you'll often have this problem when you bring your camcorder from the cold outside air, it will immediately condense inside your camcorder. To avoid this, you should seal your camcorder in an airtight plastic bag like this one. You can get these at any grocery store. It's just a standard Ziploc bag. And then take it inside and allow your camcorder to warm up inside the bag for at least an hour before you take it out of the bag. Dust is another element that you need to keep out of your camcorder. If dust gets into the tape enclosure and contaminates the tape, all of your footage on that tape can be ruined. So whenever you're shooting in dusty conditions, which includes anytime it's windy or an open car, plane, or helicopter, you need to make sure that the tape compartment is taped to keep dust and dirt out. We usually use gaffer's tape or even first aid tape for this purpose because it's easy to take off and it doesn't leave any mess on the camera. Another good investment is a 52 millimeter UV filter. This just simply screws into the filter threads on the end of the camera. And its main purpose is to protect the primary lens of the camera from damage. It's much cheaper to replace a filter like this than it is the lens itself. And you also should have a good lens cleaning brush and puff. This is used for blowing dust and brushing dust and dirt off of the lens. And you should also have a lens cleaning cloth. So that once you've cleaned off the large pieces of dust and dirt with your brush, then you can apply the lens cleaning cloth to the lens itself. Be particularly careful about fingerprints because the oil in your skin will actually etch its way into the coating on the lenses or filters. So whenever you touch a filter or a lens accidentally, be sure to clean it as quickly as possible. As far as videotape goes, the Sony DV mini cassettes have a computer chip built into them that makes the tapes quite expensive. There are Panasonic DV mini cassettes that are less expensive, but they are metal particle tape, and these camcorders are designed to use metal evaporated tape. So, for the moment, until another manufacturer comes out with metal evaporated DV mini cassettes, we do recommend that you use only the Sony tape. And finally, you should acquire the Sony DV head cleaning tape. You'll want to have it handy if and when the video heads get dirty. Here we go! out of the way, we're going to begin showing you how to manipulate the manual settings on these camcorders to achieve the look you want. And one setting that you need to think about every time you turn the camcorder on is white balance. The reason you need to set the white balance is that light comes in different colors or different color temperatures. Standing here in this doorway, I have sunlight shining on one side of my face, and I have a quartz halogen video light on the other side of my face. So with the camcorder set up for indoor light with the little light bulb symbol, this side of my face will look bluish, whereas this side of my face will look normal. And that's because sunlight has a color temperature of 5,500 degrees Kelvin, which is on the bluish end of the spectrum. So now if we switch over to the sunlight white balance setting, 
Now, this side of my face will look fairly normal, and this side of my face will look reddish or amber, kind of a muddy amber color. And that's because quartz halogen lights have a color temperature of 3200 degrees Kelvin, which is on the reddish end of the spectrum. So in order to get the best color rendition, you need to select the right white balance setting. Place the hold auto lock switch in the middle twice and you have the sunlight setting. You should use this setting whenever you're shooting under sunlight. Press it again and you have the indoor setting with the light bulb symbol. Use this setting when you shoot under standard incandescent or video lights. Press the white balance button again and there isn't any white balance symbol. This is the auto white balance mode. Auto white balance works by taking all the colors in the image, adding them together and calling the average white which works pretty well when there's a great variety of colors in the image, and it works lousy when there isn't. So you shouldn't use the auto white balance function except in situations where you can't use the outdoor, the indoor, or the manual white balance modes. And that's pretty much limited to situations where you're going between different light sources, such as moving from outdoors to indoors. Press the white balance button once more, and with the VX1000, you have the one push white balance symbol. This is the same symbol that appears on this button, and this is for manually setting your white balance. And you should use it whenever you're shooting under standard fluorescent lights. There are daylight balanced fluorescent tubes, which are close to sunlight, but for most fluorescents, you should manually white balance the camcorder. You should also manually white balance if you're in a mixed light situation with some sunlight, some incandescent light, and some fluorescent light. To manually white balance, hold a white card in the light that is striking the subject. Focus your camcorder on the white card so that it fills the screen. Then press the one push white balance button. Your camcorder is now white balanced for this mixed light. To manually white balance the VX700, place it in auto white balance mode by pushing the white balance button until there isn't any white balance symbol. This is auto white balance mode. Focus the camcorder on the white card and now press the white balance button once more so that hold is displayed in the viewfinder. So now with the camcorder white balanced for this mixed light situation, the right side of my face looks a little bit blue and the left side of my face looks slightly amber, which is better than it was before. But the best way to handle this situation is to color correct one light source so that it matches the other. You do that by using color correction gels. And I have here an amber gel, which corrects sunlight to the same color temperature as the video lights. And I have a blue gel, which color corrects the video light to the same color temperature as the sunlight. And I also have here a set of color correction gels, a swatch book of them. And in here you'll find the blue gel for correcting quartz halogen light to sunlight, as well as the amber gel you use for correcting the sunlight to quartz halogen. And you'll also find a green gel, which is for correcting sunlight to fluorescent, and also some purple gels, which are for correcting uh, fluorescent to sunlight. Here we go. The zoom lens on your camcorder allows you to change the focal length of your lens. You can zoom in for a telephoto shot or zoom out for a slightly wide angle shot. These camcorders do not have a manual zoom ring, so there isn't any way to manually adjust the focal length of the lens. The only way to zoom in or out is through the electrical zoom mechanism. Holding down the T side of the switch zooms it into telephoto, and holding down the W side zooms it out to wide angle. When operating the zoom, you actually get a little indicator here on the left-hand side of the viewfinder that tells you where you are in relationship to the wide angle end and the telephoto end. Press halfway down on the zoom button for a slow speed zoom and press all the way down on the zoom button for high speed zoom. There's at least one speed in between the high and the low speed, but try not to get carried away with the zoom control. Try to use it for specific effects like bringing out detail in a wide angle shot. The zoom range of these camcorders goes from about 6 millimeters on the wide angle end to 60 millimeters in length at the telephoto end. Now these camcorders also have a digital zoom. To turn on the digital zoom, open up the rear door of the camcorder and first go into the menu system and turn the digital zoom on in the menu system. And then come over here and set this switch to the zoom position. Now when you zoom, the zoom indicator in the viewfinder will have a little mark which tells you when the digital zoom starts to kick in. Right now the camcorder is not using the digital zoom, but as soon as Michael zooms in a little bit further, the digital zoom electronically magnifies the image. The problem with the digital zoom is that as it magnifies, the resolution decreases and the image has more grain or noise. 
For this reason, avoid using the digital zoom as much as possible, and I prefer to have it turned off in the menu system just so I don't accidentally use it. Now, one thing you should understand about zoom lenses is that they distort space. With a wide-angle lens, the distance between the foreground and background expands. So San Francisco in the background there actually looks further away. So now with the telephoto lens, the distance between the foreground and the background becomes compressed. So San Francisco in the background actually looks closer to you than it actually is. And now with the normal length lens, it's as if you were right here on the pier with me. And it's very close to the human eye. Here we go. The camcorder automatically focuses on the subject. It does this by constantly adjusting the focus, searching for the sharpest image. Unfortunately, this searching effects makes the camcorder go slightly in and out of focus all the time, so it's best to use the autofocus as little as possible. To manually focus your camcorder, first place the focus switch in the manual position. And the hand symbol for manual focus appears in the viewfinder. Now you want to zoom all the way in on your subject, and by zooming in, you'll get the sharpest focus that'll work at any focal length. When you focus, the white triangles indicate the direction you need to rotate the focus ring. And when you're exactly in focus, the white circle in the center will be completely filled. After setting the focus, zoom back out and frame your shot. When it's impractical to manually focus, use the push auto focus button. With the camcorder set for manual focus, the push autofocus button turns the autofocus system on and keeps it on as long as you hold it down. If your subject moves forward or back during the shot, push down the autofocus button until they stop moving, then release. At the bottom of the focus switch is the infinity position. This is for focusing on distant objects. Use the infinity position when there is an object in the foreground but you want to focus on the background landscape. Push the focus switch into infinity position and the camcorder will focus on the landscape instead of the foreground object. Here we go. The exposure of the image, which is essentially the lightness or darkness of the image, is adjusted by setting a combination of the aperture size, the gain up setting, the shutter speed, and the neutral density filter. The aperture is essentially a hole inside the lens that gets larger in low light to let more light strike the CCD, and it gets smaller in bright light so that less light strikes the CCD. Adjust the aperture size by placing the camcorder in manual mode by placing the hold auto lock switch into the center manual mode position, and then press the exposure button, and then adjust the aperture size by rotating the exposure wheel. The exposure display appears on the left-hand side of the viewfinder, and this little indicator as you rotate the exposure wheel up or down moves to indicate which way you're going. And in the VX1000, you also have an f-stop indicator, so if we completely close the aperture, it reads closed, then f11, f9.6, 8, 6.8, 5.6, 4.8, 4, 3.4, 2.8, 2.4, 2, and then open. So now the aperture is completely open. And if we continue to rotate the exposure wheel beyond open, it goes to 3 decibels of gain up, 6 decibels of gain up, 9 decibels, 12 decibels, 15 decibels, and finally 18 decibels of gain up or full gain up. The gain up is an electrical amplifier that amplifies the electrical signal as it comes off the CCD. But the gain up. So you should try to use the gain up only when you have to. Under normal shooting conditions, the gain up should read zero decibels, or if you have the custom preset setting set, then it should read minus three decibels. The VX700 does not have either the f-stop or the gain up reading, but the exposure indicator has the same 20 steps, and the bottom is closed and the top is open, and the upper seven steps are the gain up region, so be aware that the shutter speed is the length of time that light coming through the lens of the VX700, but to set it on the VX1000, you first come around and turn the aperture setting off, and then come around to the back, and Viewfinder will now show 60 as the shutter speed, and this is the standard shutter speed of 1 60th of a second. Rotate the control wheel on the back of the camcorder, and the shutter speed will go up in 15 separate steps, all the way up to 1 10,000th of a second. These higher shutter speeds are primarily used for sports training shots and scientific purposes. Here, for instance, is a golf swing shot at the normal shutter speed of 1 60th of a second. 
As we look at it frame by frame, you cannot see the position of the club or the player's hands because they're blurred. Here is the same shot at a shutter speed of 1 4,000th of a second. At this shutter speed, you can see every part of the shot clearly. But note that if you play this recording back at normal speed, the motion doesn't look fluid. It appears strobed. So you should avoid shooting at extremely high shutter speeds unless you plan to play back frame by frame or in slow motion. One additional exposure adjustment on the VX1000 is the neutral density filter. And the camcorder will actually tell you when to turn this on and off. Under low light situations, you'll see this message at the top of the screen, ND off. And the camcorder is actually telling you that you should turn the neutral density filter off. And then in bright light situations, you'll see ND and then on flashing. And the camcorder is actually telling you to turn the neutral density filter on. This is a neutral density filter. A neutral density filter cuts down on the amount of light entering the lens without affecting the color or resolution. You use it to cut down the amount of light that's reaching the CCD so that the image isn't overexposed. The VX1000 has a neutral density filter built into the lens and you operate it using the little switch on the side. The VX700 does not have a built-in neutral density filter, but you can purchase a standard 52 millimeter neutral density filter and the only difference is that you'll have to screw it into the filter threads on the end of the lens. Now the VX700 also does not have a shutter speed button, but it does have a high shutter speed setting, which you get by pressing the AE button until you get the little golfer at the top of the screen. Now the shutter speed of the VX700 is set to 1 4,000th of a second. Normally when you're adjusting the exposure on these two camcorders, you manipulate the aperture setting to achieve the proper exposure of the image. And a quick way to do that is typically to zoom in on your subject or whatever is the most important element in the screen that you definitely want to have exposed properly, and then press the exposure button. This locks the exposure in, and you'll see the exposure level appear in the left-hand side of the viewfinder. Now, the VX1000 has an additional feature called the zebra display. With the zebra display turned on in the menu system, the overexposed parts of the image will have a striped pattern in the viewfinder. If you need to make some subtle adjustments in the exposure based on the zebra display or based on how the image looks on a shooting monitor, you should then rotate the exposure wheel up or down to adjust the exposure. And once you have that setting exactly where you want it, move the hold auto lock switch into the hold position to prevent those settings from being changed accidentally. As videographers, we often need to be able to manipulate the depth of field in order to achieve a specific look. The depth of field is the distance between the nearest point where objects are in focus and the furthest point where objects are in focus. And this distance does vary, meaning that the depth of field can be very small or can be very large, depending on how you set the exposure and the focal length on your camcorder. In general, though, a large aperture setting and a telephoto lens will give you very little depth of field. And a small aperture setting and a wide-angle lens will give you a very large depth of field. So why would you want to change or adjust your depth of field? Well, one of the most common techniques for drawing attention to a particular person or object in a shot is to fuzz out the background. This is what the shot looked like before we opened up the aperture and went to a longer lens. <laughs> and this is what it looks like with a larger aperture. You can see that the background is way fuzzed out, and now the focus is now on the subject. Another effect that a small depth of field allows is called pulling focus. And pulling focus simply means adjusting your focus during a shot from a subject in the foreground to a subject in the background, or vice versa. And this technique is often used to shift the audience's attention. Note that to manually set both aperture and the shutter speed on the VX1000, you need to set the shutter speed first and then the aperture second. It won't work the other way around. The manipulation of the depth of field is definitely easier using the VX1000 since it has the neutral density filter and the higher shutter speeds, but you can accomplish the same effect with the VX700, you'll just need to use an external neutral density filter. In addition to the manual shutter speed button and the manual exposure button, the VX1000 has two semi-automatic exposure modes, AEA or auto exposure aperture and AES or auto exposure shutter. If you have a particular aperture size that you want to shoot at, you should use the AEA setting, and then you can use the control wheel on the back of the camcorder to adjust the aperture size, and the camcorder will automatically adjust the shutter speed to give you the proper exposure. And if you have a particular shutter speed you want to shoot at, then you should use the AES function, and then you can use the control wheel on the back of the camcorder to adjust the shutter speed, and the camcorder will automatically adjust the aperture size to give you the proper exposure. 
Note that in fully automatic exposure mode, when no auto exposure method is selected, the camcorder will automatically adjust the shutter speed to achieve the proper exposure. So funny things may be going on with the shutter speed and you won't know it. But in the VX1000, you can turn the auto A off in the menu system. It's the first item on the list. With this off, the shutter speed in the auto exposure mode will be locked at a 60th of a second, and only the aperture and gain up will be adjusted to achieve the proper exposure. The VX700 doesn't have the A shutter or auto exposure setting in the menu, and in fact the auto exposure shutter speed is locked at a 60th of a second. To use higher shutter speeds on the VX700, you need to either use the portrait, sports, or high speed shutter auto exposure modes. In the portrait mode, which has the little portrait figures, the shutter speed is adjusted as high as a 2,000th of a second. In the sport mode with a little running figure, the of these camcorders also have the twilight setting. With this setting, the shutter speed is locked at a 60th of a second and the gain up is turned off, which will help boost the color and limit the noise when shooting sunsets. But both of these camcorders also have some slow shutter speed settings. In order for the slow speed shutter settings to work, the digital zoom switch needs to be in the zoom position. And then on the VX1000, press the shutter speed button and then rotate the control wheel down into the lower shutter speed settings. You can achieve a much brighter image in low light situations by using the slow shutter speeds. The VX1000's 30th of a second shutter speed gives you about two more stops of light. And with slow moving images such as at a wedding, you can get a much better image by setting the camera at a 30th of a second. In addition to the 30th of a second setting, the VX1000 has the 15th, an 8th, and a 4th of a second slow shutter speeds. The brightness of the image increases dramatically at these slower speeds, as does the motion blur. So these slow speeds aren't very usable for normal looking shots, unless there's no movement whatsoever. But they do give you an after image effect if you start moving the camcorder around or zooming in and out. The VX700 has only two slow shutter speeds of a 15th of a second and a third of a second, which you access through the digital effects button. So neither are particularly useful in low light situations, but they do create the same great after image effect. The flash one effect, which freezes the image every 13 hundredths of a second, and the flash two effect, which freezes the image every half a second. Here we go. To expand the focal length of the lens, you can buy both telephoto and wide angle converters. This is the Sony teleconversion lens, and it doubles the focal length of the built-in lens on these camcorders, doubles them from 60 millimeters to 120 millimeters, and it screws into the filter threads on the end. Standard lens. And this shot is using the telephoto adapter. These two camcorders also have a digital zoom. The telephoto adapter is very helpful anytime you need to do a close-up from a longer distance. But when using it, you should always have the camcorder mounted on a tripod since any mo Now if you need a wide angle shot, you can use a wide angle converter. This one multiplies the focal length of the lens by a factor of 0.6, which reduces the focal length to as little as 3.6 millimeters. A wide angle shot gives you a much wider view of a scene, so it's great for landscapes and architectural shots. It's also indispensable for shooting in small places like elevators and cars and small offices. But be careful with the wide-angle lens because it definitely distorts faces, making noses longer and eye sockets deeper. A long lens is definitely more flattering. In addition to these adapters, there also are some filters that can come in handy. First, there's the neutral density filter. I talked about this filter earlier in regard to the VX700, but can also come in handy with the VX1000. In particularly, another filter that's particularly helpful is the uh, circular polarizing filter. You can use this filter to eliminate reflections. So you can clearly see that there's a reflection in the windshield. But if you rotate the outer element of the polarizing filter just to the right angle, you can watch it disappear. One of the most used filters on television is the star filter. This filter turns any bright high used for nighttime street scenes like this one and nighttime sporting events such as opening night of the Olympics. And use of this filter tends to increase dramatically around Christmas time. There are a long list of other special effects filters. Soft filters for glamour shots, fog filters, multi-image filters. Most of these effects are better applied in the video editing system instead of in the camera. 
For instance, Adobe Premiere comes with a long list of filters. So unless you're editing in camera, it's best to apply these effects during post-production. Here we go. One very important feature that you'll find on the VX1000 is manual audio level. The VX700 only has AGC or auto gain control, which means that the camcorder automatically adjusts the sound level. The problem with using AGC is that the audio level is constantly changing. We have this camcorder set on AGC right now, and you can hear that when I talk quietly, the AGC cranks the level way up, and you hear a lot of background noise. And when there's a loud sound, the AGC cranks the level way down. The problem is that this causes the sound level to vary. To record professional... To set the manual audio level on the VX1000, press the record level button, and then you can tell that the manual audio is on by this little tiny up-down arrow symbol here. And you'll also see your numerical audio level here in your viewfinder. Have your talent say their lines in their normal voice, and then set the level here using the control knob. You want to set the level so that this red light isn't coming on all the time, so it isn't quite peaking. So set the level down so it's quite high, but not high enough that this red light is coming on all the time. Then once you have it set, you can move the hold auto lock switch into the hold position. As far as microphones go, these camcorders are very noisy, and the built-in microphone will pick up that noise. So to consistently record high quality sound, you need to use external microphones. If you need a camera-mounted microphone, then purchase a shotgun microphone. A shotgun microphone is unidirectional, so it only picks up sound in the direction that is pointed. Now, you should purchase a high-quality shotgun microphone. This particular mic is not a high-quality one. This is a $75 Radio Shack mic, but it has the advantage of plugging directly into the camcorder. But if you're going to record a lot of sound using the on-camera microphone, I encourage you to buy a high-quality professional microphone. Two other microphones that video makers often use are a lavalier microphone and a handheld microphone. You should use only professional low impedance microphones, which generally have an XLR connection on the end. And then to plug these into the camcorder, you need a cable that has a Canon connector or plug, a stereo mini plug on the other end to plug into the camcorder. This is a relatively inexpensive Shure VHF wireless microphone and the transmitter actually attaches to your belt and the microphone to your lapel and then the receiver attaches to the camcorder via the accessory shoe. Now we've used these microphones throughout this video for all the outdoor shots and it works pretty well but the sound definitely is not as clear and natural as our wired microphones. Here we go! Oh. seconds have been quite complicated so here's a quick simplification every time you take your camcorder out you need to think about four major settings number one the white balance number two the focus three the exposure including aperture size shutter speed neutral density filter and gain up and finally four the audio level if you just want to point and shoot without setting anything manually, then you need to go to the hold auto lock switch, focus switch in the auto focus position and just go for it. If you want to make these adjustments manually and most likely get a higher quality image, then you need to go to the hold auto lock switch and put the switch in the center, the manual position. Now you're ready to start. Press the white balance button until either the sun symbol is displayed or the light bulb symbol is displayed, depending whether you're shooting in sunlight or under incandescent lights. If you're shooting under lighting that isn't normal sunlight or incandescent lights, then you should set your white balance manually by using the white card. Then you're ready to set your focus. Place the focus switch in manual focus position. Then zoom all the way in on your subject. Then either rotate the focus ring or push the autofocus button. While you're zoomed in on your subject, lock in the exposure by pushing the exposure button. Now zoom back out and frame your shot. And on the VX1000 you have the zebra display that lets you know about overexposed areas. And you can make more subtle adjustments in the exposure by rotating the exposure wheel. And finally on the VX1000, in order to set the audio level, just press the record button. Have your talent go over their lines while you set the record level as high as possible without going into the red and peaking. After making all these settings, set the hold auto lock switch in the hold position. Now you're ready to shoot. 
One more very important feature on the VX1000 is the custom preset menu. Press the menu button, scroll down to the bottom, and select custom. Then press execute. Here you can set the color level, the sharpness, the white balance shift, meaning you can shift the white balance towards the purple or the green side, and you can set the AE shift so that the auto exposure selects a brighter or darker setting. You can set the gain shift, which theoretically subtracts about 3 dB of noise in bright light situations. And then there's the reset item, which will restore original defaults. After making the adjustments you want, turn the custom preset button on by changing the top of your viewfinder. You can review your custom print below the rear tally light. Here we go. It is good professional practice to record color bars at the head of your camera original tapes. During the editing process, these color bars provide a baseline for adjusting the color settings for that tape. And the VX1000 has the capability of generating color bars, although this feature is not documented in the manual. To generate color bars, first put the standby switch into the lock position, and then press and hold down the record start stop switch on the top and the photo button. And then come over and then release the two buttons. And now to begin recording your color bars onto your tape, press the start stop button. Now both of these camcorders can also record still images. First place the standby switch into the photo standby position and then press the photo button. Now Sony sells a video printer that will print these still images out. But if you have a computer, you can also use a snappy dollars and can capture high resolution images right off of your camcorder. You can then print them out on a color printer or use them in desktop publishing documents. For those of you who want to edit in camera, both of these camcorders can do a fade and a dissolve. First make sure the digital mode switch is in the overlap position. Then place the standby switch in the standby position. And then around on the bottom of the front barrel, you'll find the fader overlap button and just press this once. And now fader will be flashing in the viewfinder. To record a fade out, press the fader start stop button to stop recording recording. To do a dissolve or overlap, your overlap button twice so that overlap is blinking in the viewfinder, then press the start stop button and the camcorder will dissolve from a still image from the end of your previous shot into the new shot. The VX700 has two additional effects, a sideways and a vertical slide. Press the fader overlap button to select either the sideways or the vertical slide, then press the start stop button and a still image from the end of the previous shot slides out, revealing the new shot. You can also edit an insert shot in on pushing a particular button. In camera standby mode, use the edit search switch to back up on the tape to the point where you want the button push to end. Then press the zero set memory button on the back of the camcorder to mark that spot. Then press the minus side of the edit search switch to back up to the end point of the button push. Now set up the camera to record the button push. And now this image right here is actually the image coming off of this camcorder. And then press the start stop switch and the camera will start recording. And then I'll perform the button push. Zero point. Both of these camcorders have a feature called interval recording. Now interval recording will automatically record a set number of frames at specified time intervals. To turn on the interval recording, go into the menu display and then arrow down to, and here you can set the interval, which can be 30 seconds, one minute, five minutes, or 10 minutes, and I'll just leave it at 30 seconds. And then go down to the record time, which can be 0 0.2, 0 0.5, one second, or two seconds, and again, I'll leave it at 0.2 seconds. And then go back up to the set item and turn that to on, and then return to the main menu. And now interval will be blinking in the viewfinder, and just press the start stop button to start the interval record. So in this shot, the interval was set at 30 seconds. And in this shot of the clock face, the interval was set at 10 minutes with the record time set at 0.2 seconds. But if you have something you want to animate, and I'll again use the clock face as an example, then you can use the frame recording feature to create a stop motion animation. Again, in camera standby mode, go into the menu and arrow down to the frame record item right there. 
And this time you're just going to turn it on. And now we can close out of the menu. And now you can see that frame record is shown in the viewfinder. Now every time you press the start stop button, the camera will record four more frames of video. So go ahead and manipulate your subject, then press the start stop button again, record four more frames, four more frames. Now using this technique, you can animate your object to move in any way you want. The VX1000 has a self timer feature that allows you to videotape yourself. In the menu system, you can set the self timer to either two seconds or 10 seconds. Then press the self timer button on the back of the camcorder and then press the start stop button to begin the timing sequence. And then the camcorder will start a series of beeps letting you know that it's getting ready to record. And in this case, it'll begin recording in two seconds. Now I have to tell you that there's a much easier way to do this and that's by using the remote commander. With this, you can just sit down in front of the camcorder, press the start stop switch and start recording whenever you want. Here we go. important features of these camcorders is the steady shot feature. Open the rear door of the camcorder and make sure that the steady shot switch is in the on position. The steady hand symbol, which actually it's more like a shaky hand, will show down at the bottom of the VX1000 viewfinder. The steady shot feature takes some of the shake out of your handheld images. Here is a handheld shot with a steady shot turned off. On. So it's a good idea to have the steady shot turned on whenever you're hand holding the camcorder. The camcorder is designed to be held like this, with your right fingers operating the zoom control and your right thumb operating the standby switch. And then your left hand cupped underneath the camcorder with your left index finger operating the focus ring and your left thumb operating the focus and exposure buttons. With a view monitor mounted on the camcorder, you can actually cradle the camcorder out in front of your body and refer to the view monitor for framing. First slip the right finger of your right hand through the wrist strap, and then you can operate the zoom switch with your right thumb, and then hold your left hand underneath the lens again and operate the focus ring and the exposure and focus buttons. But no matter how you hold the camcorder, holding it still and level is always a serious challenge. And one very helpful tool for keeping the camera level is a spirit level. You can buy one in any good camera store. It's made to fit into an accessory shoe, but you can also use double-sided tape to attach it directly to the camcorder. I like to have it on the left side of the camcorder. That way you can see it with your left eye while you're looking through the viewfinder. Telephoto shots are always much shakier than wide angle shots, so you should always mount the camcorder on a tripod for all telephoto shots. If for some reason you can't use a tripod, then get creative. Find a way to prop your arms on your knee or on a table or on the back of a chair. Sony does sell this shoulder mount. And the problem with this unit is that these camcorders are so lightweight that every little movement in your body tends to shake the camcorder around. So unless you're willing to add a five pound weight to the back of this shoulder mount, you're probably better off holding the camcorder in your hands or using a tripod. When doing handheld pans and tilts or pan tilts, the best technique is to set up for the end shot and then twist your body around to the beginning shot. That way your body twists naturally throughout the shot and you can hold the end shot for as long as you need to. Now when you're walking with the camcorder, you need to bend your knees and take little tiny steps so that you take all the bounce out of your walk. Now if you're walking backwards, then you want to have a second person grab you by the back of your belt and pull you along, steering you around obstacles. But with a view monitor mounted on the camcorder, you can actually turn the camcorder sideways and that way you can walk along with someone by yourself. Now if you want steadier shots at faster speeds, then you should use one of the many Steadicam devices that are available. These steady can the handle to allow the camera to move, and they also use a series of counterweights at the bottom. But you should note that these devices add a lot, of, so I wouldn't commit to using one of these for more than a few minutes at a time. And of course, for the steadiest and smoothest shots of all, you should use a tripod. Now, professional tripod and head are quite expensive, but they allow you to do very smooth pans and tilts. A less expensive tripod like this one is not quite so useful for doing pans and tilts. But one thing I like about this tripod is the center leg pops out to form a monopod. And a monopod allows you to move quickly while still helping you steady the camcorder. Here we go. Framing the shot is one of a videographer's most important tasks. 
and the framing and composition of the shots in standard broadcast television is based on four time-tested guidelines. The rule of thirds, leading, cut between the joints, and headroom. The rule of thirds says that you should think of your screen as divided into thirds, vertically and horizontally, and you should place the elements that you most want to emphasize on or near these lines. For instance, this mid-shot has my eyes on the upper line, my body along the left line, and my arms stretching out along the bottom line. The concept of leading says there should be more space on the side of the screen into which a subject is looking or moving. So for instance, this makes more sense than this. And this makes more sense than this. But if your subject is directly looking into the camera, then you want to ignore the rule of thirds completely and simply center your subject in the middle of your shot. The cut between the joints rule and the concept of headroom are specifically about how people should fit into the frame. The cut between the joints rule says that the bottom of the frame should cut the subject between the major joints rather than at the major joints. So the bottom of the frame should cut below the knee, above the knee, but not at the knee. Below the elbow, above the elbow, but not at the elbow. The concept of headroom says that in most size shots there should be an appropriate amount of room between the top of the head and the top of the frame. A mid shot cuts below the hips or above the hips and has slightly less headroom. A mid close up cuts above the elbow with less headroom. A close up includes part of the shoulder with the hair just grazing the top of the frame. And you never cut a shot at the neck unless you're really going for that decapitated look. And the one shot that doesn't have any headroom at all is the big close up. <laughs> When it comes to lighting, again, there aren't any rules, but there is a standard method, and that standard method is called three-point lighting. Three-point lighting begins with a key light, which is the brightest light striking the subject. For instance, a broad, soft light like this Chimera light bank definitely gives you a more appealing image than a, a hard, sharp light. You want to position the key light slightly to one in sun, but the key light by itself creates a high con. A second light called a fill light is used to lighten or fill these areas and is typically placed on the opposite side of the camera from the key light and is in a reflector like this one is often used as a fill light. The third light in three-point lighting is a separation light. The separation light is positioned above and slightly behind the subject, subject making them stand out better from the background. In this video, we obviously can't cover the entire subject of lighting, but I can recommend highly Bill Hoshevnikov's four-tape series called The Power of Lighting for Film and Video. Here we go. If you place the camcorder in the VTR mode so you can play back a tape, and then turn on the menu display, you'll discover there are a couple of new menu options. The A-Mix balance setting allows you to balance the left and right audio channels, and the search function with its C memory, cassette memory, allows you to turn on and off the cassette memory function. The cassette memory function, you can search for a particular photo on the tape, but it only works if you're using a video cassette that has a memory chip. And first of all, you have to press the search button on the remote commander, and that brings up a list of the video by date, and then press the forward search to move down through the list and the backward search to move back through the list. And when you find the item you want, just simply stop and the camcorder will rewind or fast forward to that particular set of video. Now you can also do the same thing for a photo search, just simply press the search button twice to get the photo list and then use the forward search button to move through that list and then simply stop and the camcorder will fast forward to that particular photo. If you go back into the menu function and turn the C memory item to off, you get a completely different way of searching through the tape. Now if you press the search mode button on the remote control, instead of seeing a list, you'll see photo search or you'll see date search. And then pressing the forward search or the rewind search buttons, you can actually count up here and tell it the number of dates to fast forward or rewind through before beginning to play back, or you can tell it the number of photos to fast forward or rewind through before beginning to play back. There are a number of interesting functions available on the remote commander, including the frame forward and frame reverse buttons. And you can use these buttons to move through your tape frame by frame, one frame every time you press the button. 
And you can also get a slow motion playback by setting it to a forward or reverse by pressing the forward frame or reverse frame button and then pressing the slow motion button. And you can also get a times two playback by setting the direction by pressing the forward frame or reverse frame and then pressing the times two button. Now if you want to play back during or rewind or fast forward, then put the tape in play pause mode and then press and hold down the rewind or the fast forward button. And you'll be able to watch the image as you fast forward or rewind through the tape. And one final note on playback, using a firewire cable or what Sony calls their DV cable, you can plug two camcorders together and make exact digital copies of your camera original tapes. You plug the cable into the DV in-out connection on the back of each of the two camcorders. And then with both camcorders in the VTR position, you'll see DV in in both viewfinders. And then if you press play on one of the camcorders, and then press and hold down record DV in on the other camcorder, that camcorder will begin recording the digital video signal. Here we go. We're here today with Roger Jennings of Oakleaf Systems, who's written a number of books on computer software products, including a book on Windows 95, on Windows NT, and on Microsoft Access. So Roger, I was wondering you tell us a little bit about the digital video format and why it is better than the prior analog formats. Well, the primary advantage of the digital video format is, of course, that your first generation tapes are the same as sixth generation tapes or seventh generation tapes. There's no generational loss between the camera original tape and as many dubs down as you'd like to make. So things like dropouts that have plagued the high eight format, you're never going to see on a, on a DV tape? Well, I've never heard of anyone seeing a dropout on a DV tape. Uh, it would be possible to have a dropout, particularly if you had a damaged tape, a scratch. Uh, oxide shuffle uh, from the uh, tape, but the concealment, the dropout concealment techniques in DV are great. They really seem to work. The people I've talked to have shot many, many hours of DV footage, have never seen a dropout. So is the DV format better than Betacam SP, or is Betacam SP still better than the DV format? Well, the numbers certainly indicate the DV is better than Betacam SP format. And from direct tests that I've made and a lot of other users of uh, the Sony camcorders have made, there's no question that it's better. Uh, <clears throat> this is not only uh, because of the digital format, but because of the fact that it is a component, a true component format with a higher chrominance bandwidth which means better color fidelity and a better signal to noise ratio than all but the very finest of the Betacam SP decks. That brings us to the whole question about FireWire. What, what is FireWire and why is it important? Basically, this is a very high performance method of interconnecting uh, video equipment as well as other consumer electronic equipment. Basically, the high performance serial bus was uh, originally thought of as a consumer electronic interconnection system. The idea was to get away from all of the uh, rat's nest of audio and video cables behind your stereo and route uh, audio signals, video signals between devices uh, with a very simple uh, four conductor cable. We have this cable and you say we can plug it into our computer. Um, is there there's something called an adapter card, a DV adapter card that it's going to plug into? How does that work? Well, here's an example of the first one that's been created, as far as I know, for a full DV uh, motion video capture on uh, for a, either a Macintosh or a uh, PC. This is an Adaptic uh, AHA for a DV adapter card, to be more explicit, uh, that accepts DV uh, data over a FireWire cable from a Sony VX1000 or VX700 and outputs the data directly to your fixed disk drive. Now, of course, you need a very fast fixed disk drive and you need a lot of fixed disk capacity because we're talking about roughly 3.5 megabytes per second 
continuous delivery to the disk. And that's about the current limit of uh, AV drives. It corresponds to a 5 to 1 compression ratio. Okay, so we've got this idea that this is an adapter card and that we're able to plug our camcorder into the adapter card and then the data is going to be recorded onto some hard drives in our computer. So what are we going to be able to do with that data on that hard drive in that computer? Once you have that video information, then you take a video editing application, a nonlinear video editing application like Adobe Premiere 4.2, and edit your clips, add titles, add transitions, uh, and then output it to a finished movie, as Adobe calls it, make movie, in the DV format. Who are the companies that are coming out with these new DV cards, and what kind of cards are they going to be offering? Adaptec, in conjunction with digital processing systems, better known as DPS, uh, will produce the Spark card. DPS is contributing the software side and, and, and providing Adaptec with some of their editing expertise. Then Miro Video uh, is, has announced a, a cap, DB capture card and they're reported to be ready to deliver th that card in uh, first quarter, I believe, in 1996, seven. And Fast uh, Multimedia in Germany has announced a digital video card. Now there's another category of relatively expensive cards, probably in the five to $10,000 range that are coming from TrueVision who's the famed maker of the target cards. And then finally, um, <coughs> Matrox in Canada. So compared to the past, uh, when we had Hi8, SVHS, or even Betacam SP, um, there were a lot of pieces of equipment. It, was, it got quite expensive. It, can a video maker today put together a DV system relatively inexpensively and be able to edit high-quality productions? I'd say there's no question about the fact that excluding the camera and the other video equipment, you can put together a very reasonable uh, editing package with Adobe Premiere, uh, 8 gigs of disk space, and a uh, high-performance Pentium uh, processor with MMX uh, capability for in the neighborhood of about $4,000. So, you know, we have a lot of video makers out there who are investing in DV equipment, and obviously it sounds like a good idea. What do you think is the future of the format? Is it going to last? I mean, we've seen so many formats come and go in a matter of years. Is, is DV going to be around for a while? I don't think there's any question that the DV format is going to be uh, here for a number of years. Thank you, Roger. Here we go. Ah! It's clear that both the VX700 and the VX1000 are capable of creating impressive images that rival the quality of video recorded on equipment costing much, much more. And because they're digital, the final production can be edited in its final form without any detectable generational loss. The end product looks just as good as your originals. So it's precisely this capability and the firewire connection that's changing the way video makers make videos. Linear editing with videotape decks is clearly on its way out. And digital nonlinear editing systems are moving the PC to the very center of the digital video editing suite. We've reached the point where all you need is one of these camcorders and a PC with a firewire card, and you can create top quality video productions. It is our intent to provide you with the information and the training that you need to make the most of both the camcorder and the computer. Michael and I are creating a collection of tapes that cover all aspects of production, including camcorders, video editing systems, titling, graphics, special effects, and even lighting, direction, and performance. All these to keep you on the cutting edge. We really hope you've enjoyed this production, and do drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. And keep us in mind as the possibilities within digital video making keep expanding. <laughs>